It is January 19 of 2015. And last lesson we uh, talked about Luke making his big transition from narratives about Peter to <coughs> narratives about Paul. And so we're going to be taking a look at uh, the entirety of chapter 13. And this will be the first uh, Paul official Paul narrative uh, that Luke gives us. And uh, we'll, it'll be split in two parts. Basically, it's going to be divided up into uh, Paul's sermon and the reaction to Paul's sermon. So that'll be the two parts. It'll be the, uh, his proclamation and the response. And the first section goes from 13, 1 through 42. And the second section will be uh, 13, 43 through 52. So it's a pretty long chapter. It's 52 verses. And uh, we get a chance for the first time to take a look at uh, this transition into Paul narratives. Now we look at the, uh, if you remember last time we had Paul and uh, Barnabas returning to uh, Antioch after the uh, love offering was delivered. So now we're back in Antioch and uh, in verses 1 through 5 we learn that uh, Paul and Barnabas are separated away from the church Koinonia Fellowship and they've been separated out for special mission in the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit actually uh, reveals a conviction to these believers and they send uh, Paul and Barnabas out on an outgoing mission and they end up uh, traveling to Salamis, S-A-L-A-M-I-S, Salamis. And it says, Luke says they proclaim the word of God. So we're going to start picking up uh, Luke's language. He is, the, uh, he is the writer in the New Testament, gives us the church language. So he is, uh, he is the uh, linguistic theologian. He says that they proclaim the word of God, the Logon to Theu, the word of God, which literally, literally means, in other words, they programmed, uh, proclaimed theology, Theos plus Logos, or Logon to Theu, theology. And they, uh, they made their first presentation in the synagogue in Salamis. So they went to the Jews first. They went to the synagogue and uh, proclaimed uh, the word of God, or the Logon to Theu, and, uh, and began at the synagogue. They continued on in their ministry, like after being uh, dispatched from the church. And uh, we see that from Salamis, the next stop at the Isle of Paphos, the Isle of Paphos. And uh, that's where we learn from Luke of his, this incident of the uh, Sudes Prophetes, or the false pro prophet, or the pretender of divine truth. And uh, every time Paul would speak, he would uh, twist his words. Uh, Luke uses dia strafo. So this false prophet was uh, trying to turn or to twist Paul's message every time Paul spoke. And we have an instance here, a pretty stern instance, but we have Paul turning and facing this false prophet, and he curses him. He puts a curse on him and says, you will be blind for a season. And then Luke tells us that the actless darkness fell over this individual immediately and he immediately went blind. Now the civil authorities in uh, the Isle of Paphos actually requested for Paul to come to them so they were definitely open to the gospel and uh, after this exhibition they were astonished and believed, Luke says, uh, they were uh, ek pleso, which means to lose one's senses, and they did profess faith in the gospel, pistuo, pistuo, the faith as verb. And so there was a, a definite uh, response of belief, but the amazement, Luke says the amazement wasn't the curse, uh, the amazement 
for these listeners, for Luke, he said it was the uh, Didache to Curion that amazed them. The Didache to Curion, and that's a great term he's giving us. Luke is such a great linguistic theologian. Didache to Curion is the doctrine of the lordship of Jesus Christ. It's the doctrine of lordship. So it was actually, Paul was actually making a presentation of doctrine. He was actually making a presentation of the doctrine of lordship because remember in the ascension, Christ was uh, appointed to the place of authority where he is Kyrios Lord. So this doctrine of lordship was being taught by Paul and when an individual tried to oppose the Lordship of Jesus Christ, Paul invoked the sovereignty of Christ and actually cursed this man into blindness. It matched the blindness on the inside. And uh, so there was a real uh, obvious conclusion that the doctrine of Lordship cannot be twisted or turned uh, like this false prophet was trying to do because Christ has been exalted to absolute sovereignty and authority. You can't usurp him from his exalted sovereignty and authority. So a very powerful message there at the Isle of Paphos. Many, many believers were at the uh, believe in the gospel at the Isle of Paphos. Now, this mission continues, and it says we go from uh, Salamis, and then we go to the Isle of Paphos, and then the next stop is going to be a, a place called Antioch of Pisidia. Their next stop is Antioch of Pisidia, and we learn here that uh, John Mark has left them. John Mark returns to Jerusalem, so it's just Paul and Barnabas that go to the Antioch of Pisidia, and again, they enter into the synagogue to approach a Jewish audience, and they are invited to speak. And so Paul, uh, who loves to speak, he, he loves probably because of his uh, education in Tarsus, which was an intellectual center in the world. You had uh, Alexandria, Athens, and Tarsus as the three intellectual centers of the world. So Paul takes up the reins. He's going to preach here. And Luke gives us his 16-point sermon, which he spoke in the synagogue to the Jewish audience. And I'm going to read these to you. I'm not, we're not going to concentrate on the Greek here. It's better. Let's just get the points down. He divides his sermon into three parts, the period of the kings, salvation through Christ, and the call to faith. The period of the kings, salvation through Christ, and the call of faith. Now under the the total of 16 points. Under the period of kings there are six points. Under salvation through Christ there are six points. And under the call of faith there are four points. And that gives you the 16. So under the period of the kings he starts with uh, the God of Israel delivered his people out of Egyptian captivity. He endured their actions for 40 years in the wilderness. Afterward and he did offer a distribution of an inheritance of land to every tribe, to all of those he liberated. He gave an inheritance of land. And then for 450 years he guided them through the period of the judges until we reached the prophet Samuel. Now uh, after this, uh, there was the appointment of the first king, and that was Saul. And Saul reigned as the king of Israel for 40 years. But then eventually we get to David, and God raised up David as the king of Israel, who was described as a man, a man after God's own heart. So after this little brief history is uh, articulated by Paul, he moves on to the salvation through Christ. And he says, according to the promise, this Jesus of Nazareth was raised up as Savior, and he is from out of the seed of David. John the Baptist was his forerunner to his ministry, to the ministry of uh, Jesus of Nazareth. And uh, then Paul says, 
Logos teis soterias. Logos teis soterias. The word of salvation has been sent to you this day. The Logos teis soterias. The word of salvation has been sent to you this day. And don't make the mistake, he says, of the Sanhedrin, because the Sanhedrin Jerusalem condemned him, crucified him out of ignorance. He was put to death, placed in a tomb, but God our Father, Egairo, raised him from the dead, which was witnessed by many witnesses in the days following. And so then he gets to the call of faith and he says, uh, this entire ministry has been as a fulfillment of the second psalm where God declares, Thou art my son. Jesus of Nazareth is and remains the son of the Father. Unlike David, this Jesus will never see corruption. Never. And everyone believing in him is justified and receives forgiveness of sins. Pistuo, faith, must be taken up. And then Paul concludes with the verb blepo, which means to take heed and perceive this truth that I am proclaiming to you this day. Take heed, give it urgency, and perceive the truth in what I am telling you today. As Paul and Barnabas left the uh, synagogue, there was a, a Gentile audience gathering, and they petitioned him to please preach to them on the following Sabbath. They uh, they obviously overheard part of the preaching, and as he's leaving, they said, would you please return on the following Sabbath and preach to us Gentiles? So tremendous response there uh, immediately, not from the Jewish audience. The response was uh, a sideline. It was the Gentiles asking him to please proclaim this good news to them in the following Sabbath. So we have in a, a first part of Acts 13, 1 through 42, we have Paul preaching the word of God in Salamis, and then we have him teaching the doctrine of God in the Isle of Paphos, and then we have him uh, proclaiming the word of salvation in the region of Antioch of Pisidia. And take note of this terminology Luke is giving us because it all means something. I mean, if you're teaching the doctrine of lordship, then you could certainly accompany that with a demonstration of the sovereignty and lordship of Christ, which happened. So we have Paul preaching the word of God, teaching the doctrine of God, and then proclaiming the word of salvation to the Jewish audience. So we go from word of God plus doctrine of God, both contributing to the word of salvation, the overall word of salvation, which encompasses the entire history of the uh, Israeli children of God, the entire Israeli nation. Uh, Paul's sermon took up everything. He started with the uh, liberation from Egypt and took it all the way to the resurrection. So now we're ready for the response. And Luke wants to give us the response. He wants us to know what took place here. So at 43 to 52, we're going to look at uh, that moment when Paul becomes self-consciously aware that his ministry is going to be to the Gentiles and not to the Jews. And he learns this through the reaction of the sermon that he gets, which is three-part. Uh, he gets a reaction of anticipation, persecution, and expansion. Anticipation, persecution, and expansion. He gets those three reactions. So let's take a look at this reaction here. Now, under anticipation, <clears throat> the following Sabbath, uh, we read in 44 that almost... Uh, the entire city gathers to hear Paul preach. And they want to hear, literally, Luke says, they want to hear the word of the Lord. So not didache doctrine, but they want uh, Paul to give voice to the proclamation of Jesus as Lord. Uh, 
the proclamation of Jesus of Nazareth as Kyrios Lord. They want to hear of this lordship of Jesus Christ. But uh, in 45, we learn that the response by the Jews, the Jewish audience that is there, uh, obviously, uh, for the following Sabbath, they become jealous at this popularity of Paul, uh, and they speak against him and contradict him and oppose him in every way. And Luke says they even created blas uh, blasphemy because they ended up even speaking out against spiritual truth. Paul boldly rebukes these people in verse 46. He says, you have rejected and pushed away the word of God. You judge yourselves with these actions. Crenate. He says, you, you have judged yourselves by acting this way. And so he makes the key awareness statement. Strefo ethnos. Strefo ethnos. We are turning away from you, and we are going to turn toward the Gentiles. And then this calls up in his memory. He says in verse 47, the Lord has commissioned me to witness and to preach to the Gentiles. He has to say me fos, set me in a place to be a light to the Gentiles. And I am to reach to the far ends of the earth with this proclamation. Now in 48, the Gentiles hear this and rejoice. They are excited. And so they, are, they start glorifying the word of Christ's lordship right away. And then uh, Luke says that in 48 and 49, many believed. And they went, and the multiplication principle sets in here. They went out and started proclaiming the word themselves. So there was a faith and witnessing was the response from the Gentiles. They went out and they, the Diaphero carried the gospel throughout the entire region. Now, that was the anticipation or the expectation that was the response from the Gentiles, but from the Jewish audience, in verse 50, we learn that uh, there was a diagmas kai ekbalo, there was persecution uh, and exile. They actually persecuted Paul and Barnabas both and expelled them or, or forcefully exiled them out of the furthest border of their city, the the Hurion, the Hurion border of their city. So they were actually forcibly exiled out of the city or expelled out of the city. But then we learn in 51 and 52 through Luke that Paul and Barnabas, and I love this, he uses the Greek expression ektenaso epi autas, ektenaso, and Ectanaso means that they shook off this opposition they received as if, as, as if it was just dust, dust, dust and meaningless. They just uh, shook it off and they traveled to the city of Iconium. So they actually just continued ministering. They said, well, let's just brush this opposition off. They went to Iconium and proclaimed the word. And it says that the disciples that were there that did uh, take up the faith of the gospel were filled with the Holy Spirit and rejoiced chara, chara rejoiced openly and were filled with the Holy Spirit the Hagias Numa, the Holy Spirit so we end up finally with actual expansion in spite of this opposition you know whenever there's persecution it just creates further expansion of the gospel a greater dispersion of witnessing so we had the Gentile reaction of expectation and anticipation. We had the Jewish response of persecution. And we had the missionary response of Paul and Barnabas moving on to Iconium and continuing to multiply the expanse of the gospel and the believers in the way. Or as they are now called, Christians. Now we've got that concept so in chapter 13, we've learned quite a bit about uh, this new terminology. And Luke shares Paul's theology of new mind theology. But Luke does have his own little take. And what I've learned is that we get 
they first look at a real strong linguistic theology. You know, you hear a lot about linguistic philosophy, but the book of Acts is a book of linguistic theology. All of these terms are being born in Luke's writing, and they are very purposeful. He's an educated man. He's not just um, accidentally selecting this terminology. All of these words, all of these concepts are concepts that glorify God. And Luke is creating Christian language. So that's going to wrap us up for all of chapter 13, and we'll pick up with uh, chapter 14 in the next lesson.